well, the beginning of August, maybe you cannot read that very well on the screen and you don't need to take the notice of it because you have copies on, uh, on the desk uh, at the entrance. So if you have uh, students who could be interested to attend this school, you know, the Garges schools are always rather nice. We have uh, 12 days, uh, nearly two, two full weeks uh, in a nice location that you can see here uh, in an institution which is quite uh, uh, well established with uh, all the facilities, computers, etc. And this is a very lively school which is uh, very often very well supported by, by ICAM and which is which is, uh, I think, extremely interesting for everybody who can attend such a school. So, don't hesitate to pick up one of these uh, sheets uh, on the desk if you are interested. Well, before the session starts, um, let me just very briefly mention the uh, program uh, slightly. I'll change um, meeting soon. We're going to uh, give a talk this afternoon instead of yesterday. So uh, we got the exchange between the uh, uh, GDI and meeting soon's talk. That's all. Thank you. So we open our session on the counter physics. First speaker, Silke Paschen from Vienna. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so thanks to the organizers for having me here. I enjoy it very much. Um, so uh, this is the first talk officially on counter physics, even though we have had some already. Um, oh. Um, so, um, even though I'm talking on uh, topological aspects, or putative topological aspects of these systems, I uh, will give uh, a very short uh, introduction on quantum physics and heavy fermions, um, because I want to um, suggest that uh, this is a very interesting playground um, to study also uh, topological uh, effects, and um, this playground arises because of the great tunability of uh, heavy fermions and condo systems in general, and um, I want to briefly show what I mean by that in the introduction. Okay, so let's start with a brief introduction to condo physics uh, and heavy fermion uh, systems. So, uh, in essence, uh, the problem is uh, illustrated here. So, what we have in uh, um, heavy fermion systems, we have, in some sense, a two-band situation. Um, or two constituents of uh, the problem. We have local magnetic moments, which uh, come from uh, typically 4F elements, and we have um, what is uh, shown here as blue, we have conduction electrons, and uh, these two systems, subsystems interact uh, via mainly two uh, interactions. Uh, the condo interaction, which uh, um, in which the conduction electron ensemble tries to skin, uh, screen the local moments, and um, the RKKY interaction in which, via the conduction electron spin polarization, uh, the local moments interact with each other, and uh, these are competing trends. So this interaction wants to um, bring the system to a magnetically ordered state, and this interaction wants to um, make it completely uh, paramagnetic because all uh, moments are screened. And you see that there's uh, these two uh, energy scale or these two um, interactions have different um, behave func functional forms on uh, the interaction parameter, which is uh, the condo, uh, what is the exchange interaction between the local moment and the conduction electrons. And thus, uh, if we could tune this uh, interaction parameter, we could uh, find a situation where at large j, um, the condo interaction wins, but at smaller j, uh, the magnetically ordered state uh, wins, and thus we um, are very likely to find a competition of different phases uh, in such systems, and um, because these two energy scales 
are present, we are likely to have a very soft system upon tuning. And uh, that can help us to discover new phases and new behavior. Um, just a very quick uh, reminder after the talk of, um, of gee, I forgot his name. Oh. Paul, yesterday or the day before, you, you still remember, of course, the periodic table and you know um, that the ingredients we are working with in condo systems are typically the rare earth uh, elements and the simplest case is cerium, which has just one 4F electron, so localized uh, orbital gives rise to a local moment, that's the red uh, part of our interaction. And then typically we have... Um, <coughs> D elements, uh, which still have relatively uh, strong, uh, large density of states, which is important for the condo interaction. So typically, F and D elements together give rise to condo physics. And of course, the cartoon-like picture um, drawn by Pierce is that uh, at high temperatures, so, so you, you imagine that you put in your local moment into your conduction electron C, then either switch on the interaction or just uh, lower the temperature so that the interaction can play, and then the conduction electrons screen that local moment. Uh, that gives rise uh, to the condo resonance in the conduction electron part. Um, so you go over from a situation where you have a simple uh, band structure, maybe par parabolic bands of the simple conduction electrons, and you go to a situation where the density of states um, is extremely sharp and peaked uh, in a single impurity picture, as you have seen, for instance, in the talk of uh, Eva Andre. And um, in the heavy fermion mist materials, we are interested in a lattice of local impurity. So we have serum on a regular lattice uh, site in the compounds, and we do thus the, the same for the whole lattice. And that uh, gives rise to a feature in the condo resonance, which is uh, the magnetization gap. And uh, in heavy fermion metals, then the Fermi energy is uh, in... Um, one of the um, parts of the condo resonance, so it's they are metals, but we can also have the interesting situation as uh, uh, shown in the talk by Sushitra, where the Fermi energy is uh, presumably in the gap, so that should be insulators, and uh, that, that would be the condo insulators where just the filling is such that the Fermi energy lies in the gap. Um, of course, associated with that density of states uh, renormalization, uh, is uh, a strongly enhanced effective mass, which gives the name to heavy fermion systems. Um, so for a long time, people have been collecting materials um, and measuring their um, Fermi liquid parameters, because in the low temperature limit, many of these systems um, show Fermi liquid properties, and then there are easy measures from the resistivity, from the specific heat, from the um, magnetic susceptibility, to extract uh, the effective mass as one of the key Fermi liquid parameters. And then you can plot these parameters um, versus each other. For instance, the A coefficient of the resistivity versus the Sommerfeld coefficient of the specific heat. And you can sort of make your heavy fermion uh, zoology by just saying, oh, how heavy is your system? So um, that has been done quite successfully. And, and of course, the fact that they lie on this line confirms that uh, they obey uh, Fermi liquid theory because then it's just, uh, the ratio is constant because it's just the effective mass. Um, the only parameter in here that's uh, true for many systems, at least approximately. Um, and, and that's it. Nice, right? So heavy fermions are understood. But um, really, to, in, a, in order to understand it, you need more than just seeing Fermi liquid behavior, and you need more than just doing a type of zoology by plotting on your compounds. Um, so what really helps to better to understand what's really going on is taking a single material and tune it by um, so-called external tuning parameters. And for instance, if you look uh, at these points here, you see um, one of the materials in turbine road into silicon two showing up here twice, once at zero Tesla, once at six Tesla, so even a single material can apparently uh, be driven along uh, this line and be uh, heavier or lighter than liquid. So that's one thing that has been done. Yes? Can I interrupt with one yes. question, if, if you don't mind? Um, last slide. Last slide. And uh, you wrote M sine of M times 1 plus F, one third F1S. 
we don't have transition invariance, right? And so where do you measure the F1s here and, and how do you get this relation? Oh, that that's just comes out of Fermi liquid theory. That's the Fermi liquid parameter. Um, <coughs> symmetric in spin exchange. It, it, it works for helium free, but it doesn't really work for Yeah, that. so this is sort of trying to, to do the generalized fact, plot. It's not, yeah, not, not transition it's invariant. Not you transition don't have it's, it's Galilean invariant that you need for that relationship. And fine, there's, fine, no, sorry, that's right, there's sorry. no Galilean I'm invariant. Yeah, I misspoke, yeah. And the, it, I, think, it, I think it has its origin in a mistake in Mosier's book where he claims there is an effective Galilean invariance, but I don't think it's true. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm just thinking. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I get it. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is one example where you where you see how you can tune these systems. So this is, for instance, pressure tuning of uh, serum rhodium in your pipe, where you see that the effective mass um, extracted just from experiment, as uh, from the gamma coefficient, for instance, or here from um, the Haas von Alphen experiments. Um, how it really varies when you um, change pressure and we think, or they think, that uh, this is really changing the interaction strength. So that's one thing where you just change uh, the Fermi liquid parameter continuously. But even more interesting is that if you further increase the pressure, there can be uh, singularities uh, in this uh, behavior. And uh, this has helped to discover a whole set of new phenomena um, this is another example where the A coefficient shows a divergence at some critical value of this uh, tuning, um, and it has helped to discover um, the phenomenon of uh, quantum criticality or quantum phase transitions, um, where um, you see away from a, quant a critical point, you see this um, enhancement of the Fermi liquid parameters because at low temperatures, usually the system is still a Fermi liquid, but with strongly enhanced Fermi liquid parameters when you go close to this point. But if you're really at the point, you see uh, non-Fermi liquid properties, and that has given rise to a, a whole new field of uh, investigation, which, however, I'm not going to detail here now. Okay, so um, there is great tunability in these systems. Um, the fact that there is different types of quantum criticality has also helped to um, sort of draw um, phase diagrams which help to classify which types of uh, phases we have and which types of phase transitions, which are these lines here we have between the different phases. And it has helped to understand a lot um, or, or order, put order into all this uh, zoology of heavy fermions um, by understanding what are the key uh, underlying theoretical parameters and uh, where you have to place your material in order to study which type of uh, physics, for instance, maybe spin liquid, behavior could be found here in the strongly frustrated uh, region of the phase diagram. Okay, so, but here, this is uh, a talk on topological effects, so can we bring in there any, by any means, uh, the effect of topology, all these phases were just characterized by the magnetism or um, paramagnetic uh, states, so um, do we invent, have to invent a new tuning parameter, and can we do so? And, um, as we know, spin-orbit coupling is an important parameter. Um, it should be large if you want to find, for instance, a topological insulator, because band inversion can then lead uh, to uh, such interesting uh, states. So can we uh, find something that tunes spin-orbit coupling? And um, of course, I hope we can, because otherwise I wouldn't show this. And uh, let me show you how we think we are changing spin-orbit coupling um, systematically in, in a heavy fermion system. So this is the material we picked. It's a very canonical condo insulator. We start from the insulating side because if we want to find, for instance, a topological condo insulator or even a semi-metal, it's much easier if you start from a state which is not a good metal because you want to have rare states uh, near the Fermi level. And then if you start out with a metal, it's less likely to end up there. So we start with a well-known, simple uh, condo insulator, so the gap, uh, the Fermi level is in the gap. And then we replace platinum by palladium. So this is the crystal structure. It looks very complicated. Uh, one interesting aspect is uh, it's cubic and it has uh, no inversion uh, symmetry center, so it lacks inversion symmetry. And interestingly, this uh, lack is represented by this just uh, 
showing the most important atoms for that. Cerium, if you mirror it at the uh, center of the unit cell, goes over to platinum or palladium. So this inversion symmetry, lack of inversion symmetry, is really between the two main condo layers, so cerium and the transition metal element. So what happens if we do that? Um, first of all, interestingly, this is uh, an isocyte uh, substitution series. Um, you see that going from full platinum to full palladium, um, the lattice parameter does not change uh, by anything. So this is just a comparison with other typical substitution series where you see either an increase of the lattice parameter or a decrease, but here pretty much nothing is happening. So we don't have chemical pressure um, in this substitution series. Also, of course, this is an isoelectronic substitution, so we don't expect any doping effects. But, of course, since palladium and platinum have very different masses, uh, we expect already just from the atomic uh, spin orbit coupling um, a sizable difference, and there's an estimate uh, made by Haruma and Yanase of how, how different the spin orbit coupling should be in these two um, elements. So that's uh, what we think might be happening. A substitution series uh, could be a spin orbit coupling tuning. Uh, what happens to the physical properties? And I'm just showing you one example here. Um, this is the electrical resistivity, and the effect is, in fact, really drastic. Um, so we go over from this condo insulating characteristic, where you can fit an activated gap at high temperatures, um, and then completely collapse this gap by just essentially doing nothing, you would say. It's not doping, it's not chemical pressure. It's just been orbit coupling change, at least to first approximation, and uh, we completely collapse the condo insulator gap by doing that. Um, so just this highlights this behavior. Um, this is the gap we extract, uh, delta over Kb. And um, in fact, we lose track of the gap because it becomes ill-defined um, at, at highest substitution. We cannot really extract anything reliably uh, as a gap, even though it's still increasing slightly with decreasing temperature. Okay, so what, what about this trend? So it, it seems like, of course, a platinum is heavier, so it has stronger spin orbit coupling. We have the insulator at stronger spin orbit coupling, the semi net metal at weaker. Does that make any sense? And uh, we just looked into published uh, theoretical predictions. Um, of course, there's nothing for the very system we are studying, but uh, we compared with um, spin orbit coupling tuning study in something called Honeycomb Anderson lattice model. I don't go to any detail here, so they just have um, the spin orbit coupling strengths um, can be treated by this term in this uh, Hamiltonian. And indeed, what they find for a specific situation at half uh, filling here in this case, that indeed um, the semi metal, in this case a Dirac condo semi metal, is found at weaker spin orbit coupling than what they say is a topological condo, in, uh, condo insulator here. So the trend. Um, is at least reproduced in some maybe related uh, theoretical models that uh, the semi-metal is at weaker spin orbit coupling than the insulator, which would mean or imply, <coughs> if we believe uh, the relation to this theory, that uh, the platinum system is a topological condo insulator, which we don't know yet. So it's, uh, I think, not decided. Um, so don't you have a change of lattice parameter from the pure platinum to the no. pure platinum? No, we don't. That's what I showed in the lattice parameter. It's none. So, the, but that's quite well known that platinum and palladium they really have exactly the same atomic uh, sizes. So, but I mean the measured lattice parameter is really the same. Okay, so now let's look at this end compound. There's not so much time left, unfortunately. Oh no, I have ten minutes. Okay, that's fine. Good. Uh, so now let's look at the end compound, which um, thus is a semi-metal, as you have seen. Is it um, an interesting or topologically interesting semi-metal? And um, I will try to convince you that uh, it shows features of uh, being a wild semi-metal. Question before yes. we go on. Are, are there indications of, of surface states in the insulating phase? Um, I think so. So uh, Joe has uh, investigated this with uh, uh, thermal power measurements and other measurements, and they could not find conclusive ev evidence that there are. But I think to rule it out is yet something else, right? I think there is no evidence for 
topologically non-trivial surface states, but also no strong evidence against. I think it's very difficult to prove that they are there. Well, anyways, I think that's completely open. I wouldn't dare to say that there cannot be any. Okay. A joke can come in. You agree. Okay. Is it a non-symorphic crystal structure? It is. Um, so, uh, let me first show you evidence from a specific heat that something interesting is going on here. So, this is the overall heat capacity measured uh, for this end compound with the palladium. Um, first of all, what we can uh, do with that is look, uh, try to extract uh, the phonon contribution, and that's what we typically do if we plot C over T versus T squared. And um, that's this plot here. And um, what we see is that well, in addition to the phonon contribution, which is indicated by this line here, and which we can really determine precisely by measuring the lanthanum reference compound, which has the same phonon spectrum, but of course not the same electronic one, um, is that in addition to this uh, linear, well, linear in T2 power 3 contribution from phonons, at lower temperatures, there's another linear behavior, and this, this uh, linear behavior sets on only a pair, obviously, here at relatively low temperatures. Um, but then there is a steep slope of linear, or T to the cube behavior, in the heat capacity. If we analyze, so if we get rid of the phonons, which we know very well, we can also um, calculate the entropy, and uh, we plot it here in terms of R and N2, um, and we can determine from this entropy curve what the conduct, let's put ourselves in a conduct picture, what the condo temperature is. The condo temperature is about uh, 13 Kelvin. And in fact, below this condo temperature, so this is T square, which is, um, if we are well enough below, we see this uh, linear behavior in the C over T versus T square plot, which is uh, plotted here again if we get rid of, if we subtract the phonon contribution. So you see this uh, behavior here, which as it cannot be due to a phonon, a phonon, of course, has linear uh, dispersion, it must be an electronic linear dispersion. And if we assume that, uh, we can uh, get from this the velocity of the fermionic particles, which is just inversely uh, related to the slope of this, a very large slope, means a very low velocity of the um, particles determining, give, giving rise to this linear electronic dispersion. Um, in fact, this velocity corresponds uh, very nicely to um, the renormalization of a, a normal Fermi temperature to the condo temperature, which you also get from this entropy analysis. And it means that, uh, or it suggests that, that what we have is a system um, which has a very strong renormalization of the energy scale from the, Fermi from the Fermi temperature to the condo temperature and from the Fermi velocity to this um, uh, velocity, which is related to the slope of the linear electronic dispersion um, in the system here. So there has been an accompanying uh, theoretical study where um, not uh, a, mod a model was made for a related crystal structure, a crystal structure which is also non central symmetric, but which was manageable in the calculation. So it's not the exact uh, same crystal structure, but this um, two uh, sub-lattice um, a, a diamond structure which, which uh, shares with our system the non central symmetric nature. And um, then uh, there was uh, a periodic Anderson model calculation done. And this is the dispersion that is extracted from this calculation. Indeed, uh, it has uh, these uh, wild uh, like nature of the electronic bands, which are due to the filling of this calculation exactly at the Fermi energy. And if you take the slope of these linear dis dispersing bands, um, of course, you, you see this renormalization of the condo interaction, which gives rise to this uh, very large uh, T to the cube uh, specific heat behavior. Okay, so that was uh, thermodynamic evidence. Uh, what else? Of course, typically, uh, while uh, semi-metals in the weakly interacting systems have been identified, or that's a, at least for many people, the first experiment they do, by uh, magnetotransport measurements. 
And uh, we also looked into magnetotransport, and uh, that's what I'm showing in the rest of the uh, remaining time. So uh, what we do first is we, uh, again, delineate uh, the condo coherence regime here because um, the effect in the specific heat, it shows up only once we are below the condo temperature. Above, we don't have that extra contribution. So that means also for the magnetotransport, we should make sure that we look uh, at the proper range um, in terms of temperature and magnetic field. So this is the overall behavior just for the end compound now um, in uh, showing the temperature dependence with different magnetic fields. This is the lanthanum reference uh, material. And uh, this just shows magnetoresistance curves which scale according to a single impurity scaling, which is uh, well known and has been studied a long time ago. But we just do it in order to see where really our incoherent regime ends and where we enter into the full condo coherent regime. And we see that below 7 Kelvin, the scaling in terms of just a single um, characteristic magnetic field scale uh, starts to fail at lower temperature. It doesn't work. So um, that means um, below 7 Kelvin, or more precisely here in this uh, scale, um, below somewhat 3 Kelvin about and 15 Tesla, we are really in the condo coherent regime. So that's in that regime, we can expect signatures in the magneto transport from our um, wild uh, physics. Above, it's not formed, according, at least that's what our suspicion. Let's see whether that is uh, reflected in the data. So what uh, is most well known in magnetotransport is uh, the chiral anomaly, as introduced yesterday by in Shidai's talk. So what you have, if you have um, this, uh, a pair of wild uh, nodes, that um, if you apply a magnetic field parallel to the electric field, you can have the effect of uh, charge pumping between the two um, wild nodes, and that will give rise to negative magnetic resistance, so negative longitudinal, because field is along electrical field, <coughs> magnetic field along electrical. That's what we call longitudinal magnetic resistance. So what, what do we see here? So we measure magnetic resistance with fields along the elect magnetic field, along electric field, and perpendicular, um, shown here perpendicular in black and longitudinal in red, uh, both below the condo temperature or within the condo coherent regime, and uh, in the condo incoherent regime, so above the condo temperature. And you see that both above and below, there's essentially no difference. So that means here, we can not resolve any uh, chiral anomaly. Um, and should we be surprised is the question, well, the chiral anomaly or the, the, the absolute value, the, the magnitude of the chiral anomaly um, should go um, with the velocity to the power three since we have such low velocity, three orders of magnitude lower than in a non correlated or weakly interacting wild semi-metal, well, it's no, no big surprise. It's very strongly suppressed, uh, that magnetotransport anomaly. It really needs huge velocities in order to reveal it. We don't have that. Oh, so no chiral anomaly detected in our system, but we are maybe not depressed or not surprised because we understand why it shouldn't uh, be observed for Okay, but there's uh, other effects. So what, what about Hall effect? So we started to study the Hall effect. Yes, thank you. Um, and um, my student was uh, very surprised about this observation here. So this is the Hall resistance transverse uh, voltage measured when you just cool the sample, of course, in electric field, obviously, because we feed the current, but in absolutely no magnetic field. And uh, what is observed is that once we are really fully in the condo coherent regime, above here is no, no effect, but then we see a very clear signal uh, of spontaneous Hall effect. Um, we can estimate the magnitude of this effect, um, and, and uh, one usually does it by, so this is completely bulk three-dimensional crystal. One does it by comparing um, to the so-called 3D quantum uh, conductivity, conductivity quantum by um, selecting the lattice parameter as, as the measure of, of the thickness of the sample. So in a 2D system, of course, you don't need to do that, but here we use the lattice parameter and it ends up to be about 30% of that 3D um, 
conductivity quantum. So it's a huge effect. Um, it's also very reproducible. We measure it with many different samples. So there's a very um, strong Hall effect in the absence of magnetic field, right? In a Hall effect, usually you just get it in a, in, um, a material if you apply a magnetic field or if the system itself is magnetic. So if you have a spontaneous magnetization, of course, and the Hall effect, normal Hall effect comes from Lorentz force, you can also deviate the charge carriers if you have some intrinsic magnetic fields. So in order to uh, see whether that is the case, uh, we went to uh, do USR experiments at Paucero Institute, which is uh, the most accurate uh, way to detect whether there is spurious magnetism. And as shown here, this is the electronic contribution in zero field USR experiments. There is absolutely no um, change of the relaxation rate. In fact, if we measure um, the signal in zero field um, and in um, finite field, we cannot see any difference. So that means um, we have to then disentangle the nuclear and the electronic contribution and the nuclear contribution. So just from unoriented nuclear moments, it's even much larger than the electronic signal. So this is absolutely non-magnetic, this material. There's nothing uh, in the magnetization. So there must be another origin of this um, spontaneous uh, Hall effect. And, and what is it? So let's uh, remind ourselves of what a wild semi-metal actually means. Um, so wild semi-metals, um, if they are non-magnetic, occur in systems with broken inversion symmetry, as our uh, crystal structure is. And uh, you have these two wild cones. It's shown in an energy um, wave uh, a K representation here. And here it's shown in a purely uh, K-space uh, representation. So what you have, you have this very flux going from one uh, while node to its anti-while node. And that flux um, is, of course, anti-symmetric in K. And that can be the origin of a spontaneous Hall effect. In fact, that has recently been uh, theoretically shown uh, in this paper here that um, the Berry curvature dipole, which is directly related to this uh, Berry uh, curvature flux here, um, can be expressed as this. So you have the uh, whole conductivity is proportional to the Berry curvature dipole, and that uh, is related to this uh, Berry curvature derivative in k-space, um, averaged over uh, k-space um, and integrated up to the Fermi energy. Okay, so what, what does it mean? Uh, it means, in fact, that the conductivity is a nonlinear effect. That's also why it's called nonlinear. Um, and in particular, it does depend on the scattering uh, time. And uh, so we should see whether that holds in our material. And uh, this is shown here. We show um, the behavior. Now you should look at the red line here. Um, Hall conductivity versus uh, longitudinal conductivity, and indeed there's a linear relation between the two, as I said, zero field still as function of temperature in the conductivity regime, where it should hold, if at all. Um, that means that indeed uh, we have this nonlinearity in our effect. The sigma xy is proportional to sigma xx, and that of course is proportional to the scattering time. Um, let's a second uh, look at this expression here. Um, what is really this uh, Berry curvature dipole? In fact, this derivative here is called uh, the Berry curvature dipole density. And um, we just I just show you a sketch of what's going on here on this uh, slide. So uh, this derivative of the Berry curvature dipole. Uh, looks like this here in k-space. So this is the zero, and then you go one k-direction, the other k-direction. The dipole is just like a divergence, and you take the derivative, and it looks like this black line here. So um, in order to have a finite um, effect of this, what you need uh, is that the while um, cones have to be tilted. If they are not tilted, so you have to integrate up to the Fermi energy of this uh, Derivative, that's what this formula says. So you integrate, and this is the Fermi 
um, distribution function. So let's assume we place the Fermi energy here. And if uh, this cutoff on one side from the wild point and the cutoff on the other side are symmetrically placed with respect to the wild point, then you integrate over the positive and negative part and nothing left, nothing is left. So if you have a tilt in your wild uh, cone, you will have a net effect. And that's what we have to assume that it occurs in our system. Maybe the tilt is thick. Of course, we have not cannot do the uh, accurate calculation for from ab initio for this system because that's very complex. Yes, I'm um, but um, it's well conceivable that maybe the Conway interaction itself is responsible for a strong um, anisotropy or strong tilt in these wild uh, cones here. Um, for sure, this effect will be very small if you are very far away from the Fermi energy, because then um, you integrate up to very far away, and if there's a small uh, left uh, anisotropy in the tilt, you will almost end up with nothing. So the fact that we have such a huge effect, very strong uh, spontaneous Hall effect, is most likely related to the fact that we are really sitting very, very close to the wild point. And that's, of course, or we believe or we suggest that is because it is a wild system in the heavy fermions where the wild physics is very, uh, seems to be occurring within the condo resonance that's very close to the Fermi energy. The condo effect really pins that to the Fermi level. Okay, so time is up. Uh, let's thank all the contributors, as mostly my uh, graduate studying, uh, student, uh, Sami Jabber, um, collaboration with Chimiao C's group on the theory side. We have also started to uh, do up initial calculations with the help of Peter Blaha and uh, for the Google and Tony Shiroka uh, for, for the MUSR experiments. And let me just flash you the summary. Um, so strongly correlated white semi-metals seem to exist. They have really exotic features. Um, well, that's what we used for the press release of the first paper. They behave like slow light, so meaning very uh, flat linear dispersion in the electronic uh, properties of the system. And they have this giant uh, spontaneous hall response. Um, of course, we should look uh, into other materials. Is this universal or is it uh, unique to this compound? Um, can we find other properties um, which um, will show this, this behavior or can confirm this behavior? And ultimately, of course, can we tune it? Can we really make use of the tunability of these systems um, to find, for instance, whether this uh, is a phase? Can a, a white semi-metal be a phase or is it... Uh, just a point-like uh, system, does, does it occur? Um, how, how does it connect to other phases in this uh, global phase diagram and all this is uh, to come? Okay, thank you. Questions? Do, do, so, do you understand why uh, the whole effect uh, starts at four, four degrees or three degrees? It's very sharp. Yeah, yeah, well, um, yes, it is. it looks very sharp, so it's really, you need the, uh, the full condo coherence. If, if that is not there, you cannot have this effect very apparently. Apparently you said that the condo coherence uh, rises at 7. No, I mean, that's really the crossover range. I mean, that's here what we did in yet here. So uh, that's up to 7. The incoherent scaling works, which means you are really well outside of the coherent regime. Then we have a crossover into the fully condo coherent, and you see if we extrapolate this B star and T star, um, then we get something like uh, 2 Kelvin and um, 12 Tesla, below which really you are in the condo coherent regime. And if we look at um, a variety of samples, um, this onset um, can be maybe in one sample at slightly higher temperature and one at slightly lower, but it's always in that range where, where really the signal shoots up. Uh, all right, two questions. Uh, the first is probably a silly question, but if you reverse the current, then you reverse the voltage as well? Oh, whether we do it? We, we, I mean, the, the way we do it, it's a, in fact a DC measurement, but it's a sort of okay. yeah, positive negative there. Okay. There is no spurious offset in the experiment, if you were asking about that. And the other question I have, uh, so this is this to be a mild semi-metal uh, from conversion simply breaking. 
should blend along. That's the fact that a gap should open when you find a magnetic field, and are there any limits set on such a gap from the specific heat thing? Well, you see that it's not that sensitive to magnetic field in the specific heat. Um, this is the zero Tesla, and that's the seven Tesla. Of course, uh, it, it changes slightly, but it's not that very small magnetic fields. I mean, this is all, already in the range where we start to go outside the condo uh, regime, right? So at smaller fields than that, nothing drastic seems to happen. Of course, I mean, at very low and temperatures, maybe there can be spurious effects, but in the range where we are really mostly probing mm -hmm. the system, no um, gapping would occur because that should have a drastic uh, effect on the specific heat. Contrary to the expectation for wild semi-metal, I hope it can break both inversion and time reversal. And then you're supposed to find it open again. So maybe that's something special with the correlated point semi-metal. We don't have any uh, obvious signature here. Maybe a tiny gap can, could still be compatible with the data. One more question. Um, just had a question also on the uh, temperature dependence of the anomalous quantum wall effect. Um, so, do you have a good idea why uh, there's this answer that uh, could come to the bottom of Kelvin and what the evolution be below the critical temperature? Oh, why, why it has this specific shape? Yes. No. I, I, I don't know. That's, I think it's really. Sorry? What drives the onset? No, the onset is really, you need to be in a kind of coherent state. Okay. I think that's that's really quite natural. So at high temperature, we don't have any of this physics. Mm -hmm. Only below the condo uh, temperature, all this band structure is forming. So then you have so to you be within it, otherwise. It's the hybridization has to be fully yeah, there. Yes, absolutely. Question. Well, just to say, just because I don't know much about this material, but I was wondering, if there, are there any other density shapes or color measurements or any other measurements? Not yet. You're welcome. Okay, let's stop. Yeah, it's just really cool. Thanks. I warn you that it's not easy to click these things. Uh, so, this is very interesting, and this got a question about the uh, the core is T, you have pick out at the zero field, but still about if you have misalignment, your whole leaves, then you can will pick out at some row XX signal, which will, of course, proportional to signal XX. Then if you do the scaling, of course, it's kind of linear. Yeah, yeah of course. Out that we have field. taken that into account. Of course, there is, uh, it's, it's difficult to get full alignment. And uh, what we do is we look at the electrical resistivity and uh, we correct for the small misalignment. But you can see that in the whole temperature range from room temperature down to uh, just above where this effect occurs, there is perfect scaling. So it's really just the form factor that you have to correct for. So of course we, yes, there is, and we take it into account. So uh, I think in the previous slide, you show the field dependence of the, uh, the even whole receipt. Yes. So isn't it just look similar to the Row XX shade, the negative matrix is the shade looks quite similar. So, can so I mean, of course, we, we can also study. I just showed you because it look, looks a bit more complex. We, I just showed you the spontaneous Hall response, but of course, we also studied it in fu as function of magnetic fields. And then there is, the, um, of course, also the um, even in field response that corresponds to the spontaneous Hall effect. So, you get Hall response. Um, which is symmetric on the field, right? That is the very feature that you, you would expect uh, if, if uh, the very curvature is driving the effect as opposed to the magnetic field. Everything that's driven by magnetic field is anti-symmetric. So it's positive at positive field and negative at negative field. That's a normal Hall response, which what we see at high temperatures. System has a normal Hall response from, from small amount of carriers. But um, the, the effect corresponding to um, this quantum anomalous Hall effect is really the odd, uh, the even in field response, which we plot here. And that uh, is this signal here, which again disappears if you go um, to 3 Kelvin about. So then you really don't have that uh, response at all. But it's fully consistent with the spontaneous Hall.
Okay. Very is, quick. There, is there a specific heat normal when it goes into the the phase which has a uh, spontaneous? Yeah, this, this is a specific heat signature, right? You, you, you see that it goes from the phonon dominated contribution because there's very uh, low, uh, small amount of charge carriers, um, looks like some anomaly, and then goes to this linear um, behavior in C cube, uh, in T cube, which but is the wild signature. Doesn't it have great time reversal symmetry to have an anomalous all effect? No. What? No, that's the very curvature taking this part. Because it's got inverted broken inverted. Yes, yes. Okay, we have to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you.